we have a direct descendant of uh, Caleb Rhodes for you treasure hunters. And unfortunately, your dog knows as much about it and he says he does, but he is a direct descendant. And his name is Caleb, which I kind of thought was cool. Uh, I want you to look for something. Uh, I don't know when it's coming up. Hopefully it's fairly soon uh, t on Terry's uh, YouTube channel. We've been trying to get it for a year and about, about eight years ago, a friend in my, of mine, we went, we used to go all over the place. We was in Mexico and Dominican and we, we hooked up with, uh, who, who's a Oak Island watcher? Nobody? One guy? Oak Island? All right. Well, uh, we met with, uh, oh, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I watch it only because of Gary Drayton, because he's a friend of mine. We met him there. We went. Is that the metal detector? Yeah, he's the metal detector. I'll tell you, I, I, I will tell you, he is the funniest bugger you've ever seen. And he's got a really thick accent. So you sit, here it is. Raise your hand, Caleb. Direct descendant of Caleb Rhodes. Awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. When you, when you go out with, with Gary, you know, it took me a while to figure this out because he would go, he would say something and you'd go, because he had a real dry sense of humor, but he's got such a thick accent, I could, I could never understand. So I started listening to him really close because he's funnier than hell. I mean, he's just a hoot. So anyway, we went and met up with Gary, went metal detecting with him and, and, uh, Oh, if Terry wasn't having video on this, I would tell you this. If you want to hear a, a good story, I, I will tell you. Come and get me. But I, I don't want to put it on YouTube. Uh, but I will tell you. So anyway, after, Roger, the guy that I go with, is really a promoting son of a gun. Who's heard of, who, who's, who are the metal detector boys here? I have a metal detector. I'm the only one. There's three of us here. Well, who's heard of Kelly Co.? Kelly Co. Kelly Co. The metal detector store. Everybody and their dog buys their metal detectors from Kelly Co. And so they're in Miami. So Roger gives gives them a call, and well, he actually did it before we we went up there. We went to uh, their their little warehouse thing, and we wanted to uh, interview Stu Arbach. And arguably, Stu Arbach is the one that started metal detecting. Everywhere. I mean, if it's in the United States, it was everywhere else too, right? But he was pretty much the one, and he has since passed away. But he would get, uh, originally he would get uh, uh, minesweepers and stuff like that. So they were big buggers. And that's kind of what started, and he started selling them out of his kitchen. Well, he developed it into something pretty big time. Because they're probably the biggest metal detector store around. So we called and they said, oh yeah, you can come interview him. So we go in and we was there at the right time, just outside of Miami. And his assistant met us at the door and he goes, uh, now listen, Mr. Arbach is a very nice guy and he does a lot of these things, but, so you got 20 minutes. We said, fine, we'll do 20 minutes. And, and, he, and he also said, he said, I want you guys to tell him because he won't tell you to go home. So you guys got to come out and say, you know, thank you, we appreciate it, see you later. So we go up into this mezzanine, and below it is, is a museum, which is really freaking cool. And I don't know what it's like now since they sold it, but they had different places where, you know, metal detecting in the Old West, so they're looking for gold. Metal and they were big pirate guys because of where they were at. And anyway, we went up, and there's a, an upper floor that looks down on it, and he comes out, and him and I just hooked up, man. We just got to be best friends. So we're talking while Roger's getting the cameras going, and we're just going to town. I mean, we're just... So I look over to Roger, and I said, well, tell me when you want to go. He said, I keep going. I'm, I've got this whole thing. So we were there with him for a while, and I said, Stu, thank you. We appreciate it. Our time's up. Your buddy told us to get out. And he said, don't worry about him. So we kept going, and... Uh, you know, so uh, who's got a button-up shirt? You know, they kind of open up a little bit. And he had a great big nugget that kept kind of sort of popping out between the buttons. And I said, Stu, 
tell me about this. So he had found in his metal detecting years a million gold rings, tons of them, right? So he took them in, had them melded down, and they made him look like a gold nugget with a chain around it to put around his neck. So he's showing me all this, which is really cool. And the reason I'm telling you this is we're, we're going to get the footage, the files, and I'm going to give them to, uh, to Terry, and he'll, he's going to make a video out of it. And it's, if it comes up and you see it, it's, it's pretty cool. So we get through talking after like an hour, and we went down into his museum store, and he had some big, about this big glass case where the top's glass, you can look down. And now, tell me who knows what a dragoon is? Pirate-ish? No. It's a big honking pistol, about this long. I mean, it's, a pistol would be this big and a rifle would be this big. It's kind of in between. He had two of them there, and they were old as dirt. And the one had been restored, and the other one still had some carbuncles or whatever they are on them. And he hands it to me, and the bottom of it has got a hill cap on the wood handle, and it was one of them had a smiling lion, and the other one had an angry lion. I don't know what it probably means something, but I don't know what it was. So you know, we put it back, and Stu and I were practically I was calling him practically calling him dad, and he was practically calling me son. So we thanked him, appreciate it. He gave us a couple T-shirts, and we went. Well, about a week later, 10 days later, they call us and ask us if we would like to come to their 50-year reunion or party or whatever. And I, you know, did I do it? No. Roger went, flew, he, was, he lives in New York. He said, let's go, let's go, come on, let's go. I said, I'm not, dry, I'm not flying to Miami to go to a party that lasts one night or an hour. And so I didn't go, but he did. And uh, man, I'll tell you, you know, like you're, you're here and you meet people, which is the best part of it. If you get opportunities, don't be a bonehead and just take them and go with them. So I didn't go. Roger went and he met uh, a family and their last name is Schmidt. And they, they had a uh, treasure ship and stuff that worked out of Miami there. And if you remember a few years ago, their family, and he had all daughters, and the daughters, the girls would dive after stuff, and it was right off the dang shore. It wasn't only in eight feet of water. They found a gold coin, but it was a very, they found a bunch of gold coins, but the one they found was they said it was worth a million dollars, because it was specific to one of the kings from way back then. And he invited us to come diving, and, and I'm sitting there, for 500 bucks for a ticket and I didn't go do this. Uh, but, you know, you can be dumb once and be dumb again, and I, I, I did that. But, so, he didn't do anything with the footage on the, on the interview or any of this, and so we, I, I called Roger and I said, Roger, we want, I, wanna, I want the footage so we can, I'm gonna give it to Terry. So he said, okay, so he sends me a thumb drive and you know, he could have done a lot better job as he just taped it on a piece of paper in an envelope, so I had a big bump. Well, I got it, but somebody, they had stole the, somebody had broken into it and stole the thumb drive. So I called Roger, I sent it to him. So he goes and complains to the postmaster general or whatever the heck that is. And the guy goes, huh, sucks to be you, doesn't it? It was over. So I will get it from, I will get it from Roger. And when I do, I'm going to give it to Terry and watch that video because it, he was one heck of an interesting guy. Very nice guy. I, I really enjoyed him. And, and I, I, you know, I'm sad the fact that he's gone, but, you know, we all go. I'm Dave Jukes. Um, I've been in the Rock Creek area up here by Moon Lake. Um, there's a mine up there in the George Thompson's books. Has anybody read any of those? There's a Mika mine up there. And in, nine, I think, 1990, me and my brother-in-laws were up there, and we found that hole. There's a cabin next to it. And uh, we wandered around down there. I figured, let's, let's go down in this hole. This hole goes down about 80 feet straight down. But 
there's in the story, I guess the 1930s, 20s or 30s, his grandfather, I talked to the guy, he lives in Vernal, and uh, they dug out, I guess they found an old mine. They dug it out, cleaned it out, was over in there eating lunch, and then it caved in. So then they re-dug it back out, and what we found up there, half inch steel plate tube that they welded all the way down to the bottom and put sections about 10 foot up, then welded a metal ladder all the way down to the bottom. There's two, there's three, a teepee, of poles with the uh, pulley up the top. The ore bucket was still there and the cable that they lowered down in there to clean out all this mine. So we figured, all right, let's go down in there. Metal, the ladder looked pretty safe, so we just climbed all the way down to the bottom of that, took our camera. I got photos on the Moon Lake, or on the gathering uh, page on, on Facebook of down actually in the hole in the bottom. And then the tunnel goes all the way back to the west. We climbed in there about 10 feet, but it was too wet. There was a lot, lot of water. We didn't want to go back in. We weren't ready to get wet, so we just took some photos, got back out of there. And that was pretty cool. Now, after the fire went through that area, the cabin's no more, got burned up. The tripod's all burned up. And then after the rains, it's all filled in now with mud. It's totally bye-bye. So I think I'm the only guy that got a picture, as far as I've talked to, down inside the bottom of that. So it's it's a pretty. Cage. Something no, there. they had the ore bucket. It was about probably about a foot and a half in diameter and about this tall, a thing, and a pulley up there. Could it have been a 35-gallon drum? Cut? It could have been about half of a drum. It was only about that big. So if you got any bigger than that, you wouldn't be able to hoist it up. They had just that one pulley. They still had cables. There were still logs there used for the mine props underneath. They had rebar down in there. Um, then there was another drift about 10 feet high off the bottom that either they started the tunnel, but that only went in about six feet. But then the main tunnel went underneath and went to the west, but that's all filled in now. Gardner, Greg Gardner got a photo of and video of it, I think last year or 2020 of when the mud went through there and it's all it's been erased. I mean, it's it's gone. But that was pretty cool to have the opportunity to see that and go down in there. But yeah, that's a pretty good story, I think. So I like thanks. Great. So when I was three years old, <clears throat> my dad had come home from the mines, and he only came home twice a week. One, he was a, a lion, so he'd go to the Lions Club. And that was one reason to come home. And then, of course, the weekend and chores around the house, had to see his wife and, and take care of us. Well, at bedtime, my dad always told me stories. That's why I just turned out to be a storyteller. And he told me that he had two kings that were living down on his mine claim. And I could not believe, not just one king, but two kings. And he said he was building a castle for the two kings. And I imagine going to sleep at night being one of their grandest and greatest defenders. I was gonna get me a sword, breastplate. I was gonna have a helmet. I was going to be a knight. And I would just dream and dream and dream about the two kings. And finally, when I got punished for saying a naughty word, I got to go down to the mine and meet the two kings. <clears throat> we pulled up in front of the castle. That's very loosely castle. It was a one room shack. And from out of that shack, came the biggest woman I have ever seen. When she walked down the wooden steps, they were two by sixes, they would flex under her weight. And she scared me to death because she didn't have any teeth and I've never seen anybody that didn't have any teeth before. And she always kept her lower lip over her right nostril. And I wondered why. Well, <clears throat> I was introduced to them. I found out that human beings have last names. 
and their last name was King. And so there went my dreams of being a knight in shining armor, defending them valiantly. But Esther, she was supposed to be my babysitter. She'd take care of me while my dad worked in the mine. And by his taking me to the mine, I'd be out of my mom's hair because she had two teenage boys and a teenage daughter. And there I was, three, four years old. Well, I really wanted to have a baby donkey. And I heard all the stories about the donkeys and the mules working in the mines, and I wanted a baby donkey. And my dad kind of thought that it'd be good for pulling the ore cars in and out of a mile-long tunnel called the Syndicate Mine. Well, for Christmas, I opened up all my presents, and I didn't get a baby donkey. And I was so disappointed. And my dad, he says, well, Davey, there's one more present up in the tree. And I, I, what, Daddy? And I look up, and there's a round package. And he reaches up and grabs it down. I open it up quickly. And what I uncovered, I found out later, was, you know, a coconut. And they told me it was a little baby donkey egg. <laughs> and if I took good care of it, that little baby donkey would be born, it would hatch, and I would have a baby donkey. And I took the baby donkey to Sunday school with me. I'd sit it down on my chair and sit on top of it, and everybody would laugh at me. And I'd just go, I'm going to have a baby donkey, and you're not. <laughs> And so, finally, after a few months, baby donkey didn't hatch. And my dad decided he really needed to do something about this because I was really wanting a baby donkey. And he says, well, Davey, I think we need to go back up and visit with the two kings and maybe they can explain to you why your baby donkey didn't hatch. And so I went up there, I met with the two kings, there's Esther with the lower lip over her nose, and I found out one day she was stirring up pancake batter. I found out it was batter because I asked her, what you doing? And she says, I'm mixing pancake batter, Davy. Your daddy just loves to eat pancakes. Well, while she was talking to me, I noticed that her nose was leaking and it was dripping off of her chin. Now, she didn't have any teeth, so her chin was about right here. And so it was dripping off of her chin into the pancake batter. Now, don't none of you get squeamish about eating pancakes from now on. It's just a story. But anyway, there I was going, ew! And I ran out of that cabin. My dad was talking to the miners by the air compressor. And I ran over to Daddy. And I'm, Daddy, Daddy, Esther's nose. Davy, go away. Can't you see him having a meeting? But Daddy, Esther's nose. Davy, go away. That made me so mad. I picked up a big rock. And I was going to throw it at that big rooster that chased me around, pecking me on the bottom. And I was like, Mr. Rooster, you better be careful, Mr. Rooster. I'm going to hit you with my rock. Well, I come around. There's the chicken coop. There is the biggest deer I've ever seen in my whole four years. It had antlers everywhere coming out of its head. And it was staring at me. It had been eaten out of the chicken feed bag, and I held that rock. I said, Mr. Deer, you better look out, Mr. Deer. I'm going to throw this rock and hit you because I'm mad. He looked at me and he just kind of went, oh, little boy, go away. And so I threw that rock and I hit the deer right in the flank. It jumped straight up in the air, it spun around, it landed, and when it landed, it was facing me, and it had its head down, and its antlers were pointing at me. I'd seen Popeye cartoons. I knew what was going to happen. I turned around, and I ran in Esther's cabin, 
And Esther go, what's the matter, Davy? And I said, oh, Esther, there's the biggest, meanest, baddest deer. It's got antlers all over its head. The whole story, she grabs up a rifle, an old eight millimeter Mauser rifle, puts a shell in the chamber, walks outside. Next thing I know, I hear a loud bang. It scared me so bad, I buried my head under the covers and I went to sleep. I woke up some time later and I peeked through the window and I saw my dad and Emmett and Esther, Eddie Sutton, the nine years helper. They were all sitting around the picnic table eating pancakes. And so I walk out and there was this big deer hide stretched out on the wall of the chicken coop. But I didn't know what it was and so I asked Esther, Esther, what's that? And she says, oh, Davy." When you threw that rock at that great big deer, you plumb scared that deer right out of its hide. And that's it hanging there on the wall. I felt like the hero of the hour. I was so proud of myself for scaring the skin right off a deer. And he, then Eddie Sutton, he goes, yeah, and he runned off and left his antlers there. And there they were, all of those antlers laying there on the ground. and. My dad, to take kind of the attention off, he goes, Esther, I don't know what it is about these here pancakes, but these is the sweetest, most delicious pancakes I've ever eaten. What is your secret? And I looked at Esther and my daddy and I said, I know what Esther's secret is. Esther's nose was leaking in the pancake batter and you never saw mouths quit chewing so fast in your life. There were mouths that were open, mouths that were closed, but when the tongue told the brain what it was resting on there, they, I heard people going, well, I guess we better get that to work now. And there, the, Eddie Sutton got up, Emmett, Esther's husband got up, and they all went off into the bushes, and I was hearing funny noises like, pah, pah, pah. well, my dad, he's like, uh, Esther was crying at the table. I couldn't understand what I'd done, what I'd said, and Esther got up from the table and ran in the cabin, and my daddy says, Davy, you need to go apologize to Esther for giving away her special recipe. <laughs> I didn't know what apologize meant, and so he told me I had to go tell her that I was sorry. I walked into the cabin, and Esther's dabbing at her eyes with a dirty handkerchief, and, and I said, Esther, I'm sorry I gave away your secret recipe. And she reached out and grabbed me in those great big arms, boosted me up to her chest and gave me a big hug. And she said, Davy, the miners will never eat another pancake again. I guess from now on, we're just gonna have to eat waffles. <laughs> Who has a story to share? Come on up. Put that on and tell us your name. Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my name's Eduardo Sewane, and um, I got a little treasure hunting story, I guess. Uh, but it, has, it deals with uh, ghosts and treasure hunting. So um, down in uh, Latin America, and I don't know if other places, but in Latin America, a lot of people are really superstitious. They'll, um, they're kind of a little bit afraid of ghosts. I don't know why. It could be a little bit scary, I guess. Uh, but one of the things that they do is that they'll follow, well, over there where the ghost disappears is where the treasure is. So that guy that was talking about that house that's haunted, I want to go look. Um, but so they would follow the ghost. They're told to follow the ghost. And so normally the, the grown-ups that tell the kids, because the kids are the ones that see them, and they'll tell the kids to go follow the ghost. So I was down there um, metal detecting down in the old haciendas down there, and I... 
ended up happening to have to go and eat, eat some food, so I went to the house of uh, this old lady that used to prepare the food for people. And this is in a town that was founded in like 1620, and so there was a lot of old homes and old colonial homes there. And we got there and we're, we're, we're eating, my buddy and I, and we're telling her what, what we were out in that area looking for. And she told us that her grandchild and her other, um, her grandchild had woken up during the night once and there was this old man uh, sitting in the, uh, he was in the room and he was telling, beckoning the, the kid to follow him, okay? Telling him to follow him. And of course the kid was afraid and didn't want to do that. And he, um, on another occasion, the same old man, he woke up and there he was beckoning him for him to follow him. And finally, he tells his parents about this old guy that keeps on telling him to follow him. So he ends up uh, going, and the parents tell him, okay, next time, next time you see him, follow him to where he's leading you. Okay. So he ends up waking up again during the middle of the night, and here's that old guy that's telling him, come on, follow me, you know, so... He follows him, and he's following him, and all, and he takes he takes a few steps, makes some noise, and wakes up his parents. And when his parents wakes up, the spirit ends up disappearing in, in, over by the wall. So they end up tearing into the wall. They end up uh, digging this big trench. I think they the lady told us that they dug down maybe like 28 feet, and never found anything. And then she starts telling us uh, the rest of the story. She starts telling us that she would see this old man, and this old man would, uh, would beckon to her also for her to follow him. And this old man would always go and sit in the corner of the house where there was this chair. And, and so... Um, of course, my friend and I, well, where, where's that, where was that chair? You know, so, um, and we told him, well, we told her, well, we've got these metal detectors that'll tell us if it's, that, that differentiate between, uh, discriminate between gold and silver and, and metals. So, sure, and there was a refrigerator there now. I mean, we, we got from her that that was the corner, so there was a refrigerator. So, we end up moving the refrigerator and grab our metal detectors from outside. We run inside to grab our metal detectors, and sure enough, our metal detectors just going off for gold like crazy right there, and um, where obviously where this ghost was disappearing. And so we tell the lady, okay, we'll be back, and okay, we strike up a deal with her. We're going to get a certain percentage, and we'll tell her we're we're going to break up the floor and uh, dig out the gold that's there and um, we'd split it the way that we uh, agreed and that we'd fix the floor for her after we were done. You know, we'd, we'd pour some cement and doing that. And we told her, okay, we're gonna go to the store and grab the cement and we'll be right back um, so that we can pour the floor after we're done. And she agreed, so we went off to the store, rushed to the store to grab the cement and we came back and she told us, well, right when we got back, she told us, well, the neighbors saw that you were here and they were worried, so they called my children in the United States and, and they said not to let you dig, so we can't. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we weren't able to dig that up, but we, we knew that it was there and that's a story of how you can follow a ghost to where there's treasure. And that's a wrap. <laughs>